<laughs> Hello everybody, Ryan here from the Headwaters Science Center. I'm going to check my audio here quick. Looks like we're doing good. And today we have a very special show for you. Kind of a double feature, as you could probably see by the title. Because we have a couple things going on. And so later today, so in like an hour, we are going to be doing one of our prehistoric painting nights, which we've done a couple of these now, and like we have done with the previous couple, I'm going to be doing a painting of one of the miniatures like the folks coming into the prehistoric painting night would be getting as an example for those folks. We do still have some slots open, so if you're watching this and you're like, hey, I'm into trying that prehistoric painting thing, they're $15, like I said, starting in like an hour here at HSC. And basically what you're going to be getting is going to be one of these little 3D printed mammoths, and then you'll be interacting with Carl predominantly, he's going to be the one hosting, I'll probably be around for at least a little while too. And what we're basically going to be talking about is learning a little bit about mammoths and then doing some painting with them. And you can see I have painted a couple of other ones. I've done one of these for all of the prehistoric painting nights that we've done. So this is going to be our third one. You can see our first one that we did with our Spinosaur here. And our second one that we did with the Trilobites last month. And part of the shtick of this is that I'm not a good miniature painter. I'm not a practice miniature painter. And so part of the reason why Carl likes to have me make an example one is because I'm bad at it and I'm comfortable being bad at it and having an example that's kind of bad makes other people comfortable with the quality of work that they're doing. It makes them not feel bad. And so that's why I'm here. And so we're going to talk a little bit about just kind of a few different topics. It's kind of the way that these shows tend to go. Um, I do have like a little bit more formalized uh, demo pro eh, I'm not going to say demo program planned for a little bit later, sort of in our normal 3.30 slot that we do. So I'm going to work on this for probably about half an hour, and we're just going to talk about some stuff. And then we'll bounce over to our typical Friday programming, which would be a follow-up from the Wednesday reading. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'll probably, uh, then maybe we'll do a little painting while we're talking about that too. So probably be a little bit longer one today, but like I said, we're going to be bouncing around between a few different topics. And so... I said our prehistoric creature that we are painting this month is going to be a mammoth. And so mammoths are really neat. They're sort of, in a lot of ways, sort of like the marquee animal that people think of when they think of the Ice Age. At least the, the most recent Ice Age, I should say. Um, or if I really want to be proper, the most recent glacial period. The one ending, you know, 12 or so-ish thousand years ago in this uh, neck of the woods. Um, and they said they're very commonly associated with it because they're an animal that pretty much only existed during that time period and they continued existing in different parts of the world for a little bit longer beyond that. But they're this really interesting that is really like emblematic of the things that were really happening a lot during this glacial period and really emblematic of the the rise of humans in a lot of way in a lot of ways. And so one thing that's kind of weird about the most recent glacial period is it is very, very much a time that is associated with mammals sort of coming to becoming the preeminent sort of class of animals on Earth, arguably. And specifically what you get during the most recent glacial period is a lot of really, really, really big mammals become a thing. We get what are called megafauna. And so mega meaning big, fauna meaning animals, megafauna. And like I said, a lot of these megafauna, pretty much all of these megafauna, are mammals. And so this is a time period that's sort of after the kind of dominant era of the dinosaurs, um, where you have the age of reptiles is what they sort of called that time period. And from that time period on is what we call the age of mammals. And like I said, there's this era where we have a ton of really, really big mammals that exist. And one of the things that like really facilitates it being a time period where mammals can be pretty dominant in the ecosystems is that it is a like relatively like much colder time period. One of the big perks of being a mammal is that we uh, have this feature called homeostasis where we are able to uh, maintain basically the same body temperature all the time. And so with humans our homeostasis temperature is about 98.6 degrees, um, you know, give or take a couple degrees. But that's very different from what a lot of reptiles and uh, amphibians and fish and things like that do where basically their body temperature is whatever the temperature around them is and so when you get into like a really really cold climate it becomes really difficult for reptiles and amphibians and things like that to really be thriving in the same way uh, just because like all their body processes slow down because they don't have as much energy basically and so like I said you get into this much colder climate all of a sudden you get 
mammals and the other thing that tends to happen when you move into colder climates is you tend to get much bigger animals uh, because being big and like bulky and round is like really the sort of optimal shape as far as retaining body heat. like sort of your, your best possible shape for um, containing heat, for maintaining a temperature, um, is to be like a sphere. And so basically you can see like as climate gets, as you get into cooler climates, the animals basically get like more and more and more, you know, quote unquote spherical, they get bulkier and rounder. You know, you can see this in things like uh, like tigers are a great example of this, where um, the tigers you have near the tropics are like noticeably like lankier than like Siberian tigers are. Siberian tigers aren't like necessarily like bigger as far as like the, you know, you don't, you don't look at them and go like, whoa, that's a way bigger animal, but they're a lot bulkier and a lot heavier. You know what I mean? And like I said, that's part of is that being associated with colder climates it's the same reason you don't see things like giraffes existing in like tundra climates because it's a terribly inefficient way of uh, retaining heat and it's you know kind of the opposite situation going the other way where that type of shape where you you know are really lanky you have a lot of surface area relative to your volume is a great way to shed off heat um, and so, like I said, you tend to see that type of thing happen as you get into hotter climates, as you see animals get lankier. Um, so, things like giraffes, for example. And so, during the Ice Age, you get all these really bulky, like, heavy, and a lot of times pretty fuzzy animals. And, like I said, it's basically all happening in the name of, you know, heat retention, and then some of it ends up being sort of a, uh, you can almost think of it as like a, uh, an arms race as far as being able to uh, survive because if you you know are a mammoth and your primary way of protecting yourself is by being big if your predators also get really big that defense quits working quite as well and so you start seeing like I said this sort of arms race happen where all sorts of stuff gets bigger and bigger and bigger I'm just pulling out a bunch of different reds and oranges and browns here, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do as far as my mammoth. One of the things that's kind of cool about mammoths is they had such a big range during their time that, like, they actually come in kind of a lot of different colors, you know? It's very much the same way that, like, human, like, hair color and skin color is pretty diverse in different parts of the world. You saw the same thing with mammoths, actually. You know, there's mammoths out there that have pretty dark fur. There's mammoths out there that have, you know, reddish and even, like, kind of bordering on, like, blondish fur sometimes. Um... And it tracks pretty closely with, like, where you would typically see that with, like, human populations, too. They get lighter as you get further north. Because it's an interesting thing, because, again, when you're a mammoth, your primary way that you're protecting yourself is just by being big. You're not relying, really, on, like, camouflage to protect yourself. And so the pattern that you have on you, you know, for a lot of animals, it gets selected for as being a thing that, like, makes you hideable, makes it difficult for predators to find and eat you. But when you're a mammoth and you don't have to worry about that, it, you know, changes your equation a little bit to becoming, you know, more about having to deal with, like, the relative amount of sunlight you're getting. Which I think is very neat. We'll... We'll start, we'll do kind of a lightish mammoth here, I think. You can come and hang out for a little bit if you want. So we are open right now. Headwater Science Center is open. We had guests out on the floor and the volunteers just walked up. So. <laughs> Birds getting fed right now. Kids out on the exhibit floor. All kinds of activity happening all around us. So you'll probably hear some noise. You might hear some people chit-chatting in the back. But no, uh, I'm just kind of tucked away up in the corner upstairs. Doing my thing. And so I'm going to paint my mammoth. I said, and I don't honestly have a ton of ton to talk about with mammoths, like as far as that goes. You know, I talked a little bit about just like the color with them. Maybe I won't use this because we're almost out of it. But what I also want to talk about a little bit is there was a show that we didn't get to do a few weeks ago just because we got really busy here at the Science Center on the Friday and I never got a chance to come up and do it. I think it's a good topic for one of these sort of 
painting, sort of just vamping on whatever I feel like shows for an extended amount of time. And we did a uh, we did a reading a few weeks ago that was kind of asking the question of like what's a scientist, like what makes something a scientist. And here, while I've got Finn sitting right nearby, hey Finn, what's a scientist? Anything or curious about anything and looking for greater knowledge of something. So the so the response there, I don't know if you would have gotten picked up, but somebody who is studying a thing or taking an interest in a thing or curious about a thing in the pursuit of greater knowledge or something like that is what the the full response was. Which that's not the answer that other people I've asked about this have given. Hey Lene, you're walking by right now. What's a scientist? Define it. <laughs> a scientist? Ooh, okay. Well, if you were to ask my college professor, a scientist is anyone who asks questions and then does the work to answer those questions or try to answer those questions. So, Lene, Lene is one of our staff people here, and she said that a scientist is anyone who asks questions and then puts in the effort to answer those questions. And she said that was like a very much a what her professors in college would have told her. And I've been asking people this like off and on. Like I said, we were uh, talking about this uh, with our uh, our readings that we were doing a couple weeks ago, and Lee was sort of positing the question in you know that context and was talking about it in sort of that context is that you know a scientist is anybody who is willing to ask a question, and on some level I agree with that. Like I really like that as like a principle of like the accessibility of science is something that I think is really important. It's a big part of what got me into museums is I want to make science and the science is accessible but i think that they're like that sort of definition that finn and Lene and lee kind of talked about is not necessarily the way i would like define what a scientist is um i think like if i was to sum it up very quickly i would define a scientist as being somebody who is using the scientific method um which is kind of an interesting thing because the scientific method is something that you've probably heard of and if you don't you know fully remember all the steps of it. Honestly, I don't always fully remember all the steps of it either. I always got to look it up whenever it comes up to it. I judge the science for every year and every year I got to go look up what the scientific method is like step by step. But basically the scientific method is this sort of formalized structure of doing experiments. So the same stuff they were talking about is like, you need to have a question and you got to be willing to put in some legwork to answer a question is sort of how you become a scientist. But there is sort of this like formalized process of, you know, making an observation, doing a little bit of research, uh, coming up with a question, no. making an observation, coming up with a question, doing a little bit of research, designing an experiment, um, doing that experiment, and then like uh, doing some reflection basically on the data that you get out of that experiment, and then kind of reset back to back to step one. So observation, research, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion loop-de-loop -loop forever is sort of this this process that we refer to as the scientific method but it's kind of an interesting thing because you know like uh like finn said like Lene said like lee was kind of talking about there is like this interesting aspect of like even if you're not necessarily thinking about it in like a super formalized process like how how good of a job do you have to do like how how you know formerly well designed does your experiment need to be for it to like count as science you know if i you know am just you know doing whatever in my apartment you know I, we we do that we go through that process all the time even if we're not necessarily thinking about it you know you know i can do the experiment right now of like uh what's in this mug um i can look at it it's dark it's a coffee mug it might be coffee making my observations, I can test it, I can smell it, it smells like coffee, I can taste it. It tastes like coffee. So, you know, I had a question, what's in the mug? I made some observations, I did some research, I sniffed it, I looked at it. I came up with a hypothesis, it's probably coffee. I tested that hypothesis by tasting it. It's coffee. Scientific method happening around us all the time. Does the fact that I you know, can break down like any given thing that I'm doing at any given time, make me a scientist. Eh. Said so an interesting response that I got from some of my other volunteers when I asked them a couple weeks ago, when I asked them about what a scientist is, was they were talking about sort of this 
broader like lifelong commitment to researching a specific subject you know they're very much thinking of a scientist as somebody who exists like within academia somebody who you know has a phd and is researching some specific topic so there was like a threshold of expertise you needed to have in order to be a scientist and that's kind of what i would expect a lot of folks kind of coming off the street to say is that a scientist is somebody who like you know is a PhD actively doing like research as their career. And that's something that, you know, in a lot of places like the Headwater Science Center, we it's sort of a stereotype that we a lot of times kind of try and fight against a little bit is, you know, because it makes science seem like something that is really inaccessible to a lot of people. It makes it seem like something that's like hard to get into, hard to do. Like I said, science is something that's all around us all the time and is like can and should be accessible and understood by as many people as possible is sort of what our what our idea of it is here. There's also sort of an interesting thing with my definition that comes up. As like I said, I, the scientific method is this very formalized thing within academia, but it's not something that like has existed forever. Like the scientific method, you know, articulated as it is, is not something that was always like written down and established as a thing and he said even though people were probably doing like that same basic thing forever even if they didn't really have a name for it like when were when were scientists invented who's the first scientist you know was the first person to use the scientific method the first scientist and and call it the scientific method the first scientist because that would mean we didn't have anybody who was a scientist until like the was it like the 1600s or something like that is when the scientific method becomes a thing which is kind of a weird thing to think about like when is who is the first scientist you know who's the first person using the scientific method if you're buying into my sort of definition for what a scientist is you know and i thought that you know, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about and then you know i don't have the book with me we returned it back to the library because we read it a few weeks ago but you know, there was a, one of the stories that he read that was sort of thinking about it was a story about a, uh, like a young girl and her father and they were like, just like building a thing. You know, they were building like a little shack or house or something. And the girl was kind of doing all sorts of like imagination exercises, you know, thinking about things like, ooh, what could, what we could be building and what we could be learning and seeing, you know, with the stuff we're building. And, you know, it's one of those things where, like, is just, like, doing a thing in your imagination, does that count as science? Can you, can you run an experiment just, like, in your head, and does that count as science? It's like she was, uh, you know, they were talk she was thinking about, like, building a big tower and looking through a telescope out at the sky. And, like, does the fact that she, you know, wasn't looking at the real sky, wasn't looking through a real telescope, wasn't on top of a real tower... You know, does that mean that that's not science? Is that still astronomy if it's happening just in your imagination? It's a fun question. Fun thing to think about. But yeah, and a lot of the times the term that you'll hear in places like this that, you know, are trying to make science, you know, very accessible to a lot of people and get, you know, sort of lay people, people who aren't like trained scientists you know, involved in the science, you'll hear this term called citizen science that gets used a lot. And we use it around the around HSC every now and then to talk about citizen scientists, you know, and getting them involved because it's a good way to get people invested in, you know, things going around. And we see a lot in like sort of natural sciences stuff, sort of uh, advocacy science where, you know, you get people out there, a good example of like a citizen science thing that's pretty prominent around Bemidji is the, you know, we get a bunch of, well, we don't, but people going out to do, like, frog counting. You know, you go out at night and you listen for the frogs and, you know, document what species and how often and how many different types of frogs you're hearing. And it gets people invested in, you know, protecting the frogs as well as, you know, actually helping out researchers because, you know, getting a bunch of people to do that is a lot easier easier than one researcher, one, you know, quote-unquote scientist having to go out and do it. So, I guess another good question in that regard would be, you know, a lot of the times science is a collaborative effort. A lot of the times you, you know, have a sort of lead on a project, but then you have also a bunch of people who are participating in it at different phases. 
So like for example, when I was like a teenager in you know high school and early college, I used to work for the U.S. Forest Service and their sort of research end of things. And I was uh, participated in a lot of you know very formalized scientific experiments, working with a lot of PhDs, a lot of you know people with you know who are pretty indisputably scientists. Um, like I said, I wasn't. I was like a high schooler. Like that wasn't a thing that I like had a whole lot of qualifications for, you know, talking about myself as like a formally trained scientist at that time. And what I would do is I would go out and I would like participate in like the data collection part of, you know, the scientific method where, you know, somebody else, you know, asked the question, somebody else uh, did the research, somebody else designed the experiment. I was just participating in one small part of the experiment where I was, you know, like I said, helping collect data, basically. And then I would take that data back to the same person or people who were, you know, designing the experiment, and they would do stuff with it. And I wouldn't do anything else beyond it besides, you know, that collection phase. You know, was I doing science there, even if I wasn't involved in every step of the process? And I would generally say, yeah, like... Yeah, so it's kind of a weird thing. Like, I I feel like a big part of it is there's sort of this inherent want to... It, it's really easy to end up sort of, if you declare a thing to be not science, it's, it's taken as, like, a negative thing in a way that I don't think it necessarily, like, needs to be. Like, if I say that's not science, it, you know, is taken to mean it's it's bad or it's not valid, which I don't love. Like, I don't think that necessarily is a thing that needs to have the negative connotation that it oftentimes has. And so, like, for example, in our, you know, book we were talking about with the little girl who is, you know, doing observations in her imagination, like, I wouldn't call that science. Like, I don't think that necessarily should count as science. But I don't think it's like a bad thing to be doing either. And so I think that, you know, by, by saying that to do science, you have to like be using the scientific method feels on some like surface sort of visceral level feels kind of, you know, gatekeepery in a way that clashes with a lot of my sort of general sensibilities. But I think it, uh, the, the, the reason it feels gatekeepery is because of, like I said, the sort of inclination to assume that by declaring something not science, I'm saying it's bad or that it's not valid, which is that I'm not ever trying to do. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't science. Well, yeah. Science can be not a lot of things. You know, I could say, you know, this stream I'm doing right now, it's not baseball. We wouldn't say that that's a bad thing that's not baseball. It's just a thing that it's not. And a thing can still be valuable, a thing can still be educational, can still be informative, even if it's not, you know, necessarily fits under this exact specification for, you know, what it is. And like I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But yeah, I think it's very interesting when we're talking you know, about what science is. It seems like it's a very, like, mercurial response. It's either, like, science is something that is done by, like, highly trained PhDs who have dedicated their life to a subject, or science is just, like, kind of whatever. Like, any time you're, like, curious about a thing and have a question, that's science. And I feel like I don't meet very many people who are, like, in between. Which, I don't know. I don't know if that means anything, but I think it's kind of interesting at the very least. I had, I was doing some shows at the Boys and Girls Club the other day, and one of the kids at the Boys and Girls Club asked me if I was a scientist. Just like, you know, very you know, valid question, one I actually, you know, you hear quite a lot in this line of work, you know, people saying, you know, are you a scientist, or are you a professional scientist, yada yada yada. And I'm never quite sure how to answer that. 
Because, like, you think about it with a demo that we're doing, like, I know what the outcomes of, like, everything I'm going to do are ahead of time. I'm not really doing, you know, quote-unquote experiments. I'm not necessarily, like, learning new things, discovering new knowledge, aside from what I've already done. You know, but, you know, obviously when I'm doing, I was doing our, uh, our mad scientist demo is what we call it. So it's sort of a combination of, you know, freezing stuff with liquid nitrogen and lighting stuff on fire is sort of the, the gist of that demo. But it's like, you know, if I, if I go to our bi oh, shoot. If I go to our bimetallic strip and I throw it in the liquid nitrogen, you know, I present it as like an experiment that I'm doing. But I've done that a hundred times. I know exactly what's going to happen to that bimetallic strip when I'm when I put it in there. You know, does the fact that I know what the outcome is ahead of time mean that it's you know not an experiment or that it's not science that I'm doing when I do that? Arguably, yeah. Like I think that would be like a valid thing to say is that you know when we're doing demos here at the science center, we're not actually doing science. We're you know performing, doing like a theater performance with sort of a a uh, science-y coat of paint over it. Because like I said, it's very rare for us to be doing like actual experiments where we are like formally thinking of a thing in the context of the scientific method and actually like learning something new about, you know, via doing these experiments. I accidentally dropped my mammoth and my dollop of darker brown paint that I wasn't planning on using, so. Now I'm smearing this dark brown around all over to mix it with my sort of yellowish light brown here. It's not the uh, not the most appealing color I've ever seen, but hey. <laughs> Carl's coming over here to flex on me with his mammoth that he painted. How long did that take you? Um, in just one sitting? Like uh, an hour? An hour? All right. Hour and a half? So he's actually flexing about him. I was hoping he was going to be like, yeah, I did this over four settings over, over, you know, it was, it was six hours done over five different seatings. But no, it took him, it took him very, it took him very, a very comparable amount of time to paint that than this one is going to end up me being spent on. I mean, the joke for that one, I painted a test one before I did that one, just letting you all know, like, this is like, oh, I figured out how to do this on a smaller one. So this one went by really fast. It's practice. <laughs> It is still cheating. <laughs> yeah, I accidentally dropped. I, ba I made it this color, and then I accidentally tipped it over into my dark brown, so now I'm just trying to get that dark uh, brown around kind of evenly. I'm going to make a joke. We should start with the dark color first. Well, I wasn't planning on using it, like, because we were almost out of it, and I was like, eh, maybe I, I was save planning on doing that, and I was like, eh, I'll save it, so I just squirted out one little blurt there and was like, I'll just skip it. But then I accidentally dropped it in it, so now I'm stuck using it. That's how she goes. So what are you talking about for this one? Uh, we've been talking about sort of what it means to be a scientist what is science so Ooh, that's a tough one yeah what's a scientist carl i mean one of my friends would argue you have i know i can't be seen at all in this you're just getting my voice <laughs> yeah uh, you have to use the scientific method uh, for your like job to do what you do but that rules out a lot of jobs we consider scientists mm -hmm. like my friend who is a wildlife guy he has gone on record being like, I'm not a scientist, despite doing a career that many would consider a scientist's career. See, and that's kind of exact, that was pretty much the exact definition I said, is that a scientist is somebody who uses the scientific method. You don't necessarily have to do it as like a career, but anytime you're using the scientific method, you're doing science. Yeah. And so, but like I said, I asked Finn, I asked Lene, I talked to Lee about it some weeks ago, and... You know, it was very much this much more open of, like, all it takes to be a scientist is to, like, be curious, basically, is the like definition the that a lot of them will give. We're but museum then, workers. Like, are we scientists? Yeah. By a lot I of was, definitions, we're not scientists. And I was just talking um, about uh, when we were at the Boys and Girls Club the other day, I was doing our mad scientist demo. And so what's interesting about, like, when we do demos around here is, like I said, we know what the outcome of everything we do is going to be. Like, we're, we're not, so long yeah, I'm not actually, like, learning anything from the things I'm doing. Like I said it's a theater performance that has some sort of science-y flair to it, but it's not necessarily, like, science that I'm doing. Because I'm not, like I said, actually testing anything because it's something we've tested a million times before. So it's, a, it's an interesting question is, like, you know, the fact that I'm working with, like, glassware and flames does that make Ooh. yeah they're not super stable man it's, these ones they got that one front leg up and as soon as you you tip them a little bit 
Yeah, the tusks are going to be a little more orange than yellow, because we're almost out of the yellow, too. Yes. Okay, so that's a note to self on the next paint order. <laughs> I used a bunch of this. Well, not even really. I, I, used, used, it, a, I used it on this. We used a lot of it also on the grass for the diorama. Oh. Speaking of which, can we steal some? We have a little bit more grass today. Uh, actually, well, let's wait till we do the painting night. Huh? We'll wait for the painting night, actually. Oh, okay. Now that I know that we are running short. But yeah. So, Carl, on the same page as me as far as using the scientific method. Because the other question I had on that oh, yeah. is the scientific method became a thing in about the like 1600s. Were there any scientists before that? I mean, theoretically, the first scientists, <laughs> if you really want to get down to it, I mean, I've talked about this in some degrees. Um, well, it's cave artists. A lot of cavemen would have been scientists because they're testing and recording yeah. what they learn about the natural world and then they're communicating. They're they're also doing education work with that because those cave paintings are part art, part field guide and part like cultural. Yeah. And, and so again Carl saying very much the same type of stuff I said where even if we don't have like a formal like name that we're calling it the scientific method and like charting it out like we so often love to do. Testing you know, the the idea of like observing a thing, coming up with a question, developing a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis, it's tweaking your hypothesis, than, is older than the term scientific method is. And so, yeah, there's been scientists forever doing the same thing. There just wasn't necessarily a formalized, like... You can argue that's older than humanity. Yeah. There's animals, like dolphins, been around a while. Dolphins do that all the time. Yeah. And so we do it all the time without even necessarily thinking about it, like my drinking a cup of coffee model earlier. Yeah, that was a pretty good model. Yeah, I, li I like this uh, thing I'm able to do here. I just sit in the corner and like roast my, uh, not roast, grill my uh, co-workers as they walk by. Let them do the content for me. Let them make it up. So yeah, it's like kind of an interesting thing there. Where I said Carl's really the only other person so far who has like said something similar to what my sort of idea is as far as what it means to be a scientist and do science. I think we'll use a little, a little bit redder maybe for the trunk. Probably a lot of extra blood flow in that trunk, I would imagine. It's a sensitive thing with a lot of blood vessels in it, probably, because that helps with smelling. So it maybe makes sense for the trunk to be a little more, a little more on the reddish side of things. You don't necessarily see that in elephants, but... There's some fur mixed in there, like, maybe in the right light, it's a little bit uh, reddish. This is really a uh, a peak performance for me as far as doing a bad job painting. <laughs> that's, a, that's the idea, though. I guess while I'm just sitting here chatting with you, this big thing I got next to me here on the table is a fragment of uh, mammoth tusk. And then just off camera here is actually a mammoth tooth. So that's a single tooth from a mammoth. Which is useful as far as, you know, telling scale here. Hey Chuck! What's a scientist? <laughs> what's a scientist? We're talking about what is science and what's a scientist a little bit here while we're painting. It's a, a question that was posited in one of the stories a couple weeks ago, so we're chit-chatting about that, trying to f define what a scientist is. Just uh, grabbing people as they walk by and asking them. <laughs> I'd say a scientist is uh, somebody that really wants to know things about the world, about the universe, and so, tries to find out. So yeah, very much in the same model as what Lene and what Finn were talking about, yeah. where you know it's predicated on you know just being curious and being willing to put in a little legwork to sate that curiosity on some level. Yeah, the scientist, you know, once they if you're to be a real scientist, you have to be trained, you have to be educated, and that requires a lot of work. Yeah. And you have to be committed to scientific method. Yeah, and, and so 
Commit it to the facts. Yeah, the scientific method was sort of the defining trait that Carl said, and that's what I've been talking about too, is like, anytime you're using the scientific method, you're doing science, yeah. and are therefore a scientist. Here's a here's another fun question that we were talking about a little bit. Would you see that? Would you say that the demos that we do here at the science center are doing science? <laughs> okay, good question. <laughs> are they doing science? They are illustrating scientific ideas. They're not doing scientific research. No. No. That's what I was talking about. It's like we, you know, I, we stick the bimetallic strip in the liquid nitrogen. We know exactly what's going to happen. We're not, you know, mm -hmm. formulating a, you know, a scientific method process with that. We're not even really learning anything from it as, as the person doing it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is it science or is it, you know, you said illustrating scientific principles, but is, you know, theater with some scientific. It's kind of, <laughs> for, for some, for some people watching, it's science practice. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, for example, we might say, what do you think is going to happen when we do this? Mm -hmm. And then we say, well, let's find out. Um, that's kind of getting to the idea of what scientists do. But can, can a thing be, uh, be science? Can, can the same action be science for one person but not for another? Is it not science for us but science for the audience, maybe? <laughs> well, okay, consider, uh, consider two ancient civilizations. And one of them uh, knows how to make uh, steel. And the other one doesn't know how to make steel. So when it comes down to working with iron, for one of them it's craft, it's industry. For the other one it might be research. Mm -hmm. So it could be science for one civilization and established practice for another. So science has to be in the, the pursuit of some new information. Science is the pursuit of uh, the unknown, of understanding the unknown. Yeah. Well, that's Chuck, another one of our... You didn't get to see him on camera, but you, you probably heard his voice pretty clearly there. Maybe you can lean in there, we can catch him. <laughs> He's not great at leaning these days. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, another opinion there. He said, kind of... Floating in between, I think, sort of the me and Carl versus Lene and uh, Finn answer that we heard there. Okay, I don't know what all that discussion was, but this is just off the top of my head. Just give me a little while, I'll write an essay about it, but... Uh... No, that's no fun. I, I gotta just, like, catch people as they're going by and ask right. them. That's no fun. I gotta put them on the spot. This is gotcha journalism here. <laughs> Trying to even out my colors a little bit here, so it's a little less globby. I get eyes painted. Gosh. Afraid to pick a side. Chuck, afraid to pick a side. The coward. This is gotcha journalism that we're doing up here. Uh, what color do we think a mammoth's eyes were? They're living up north. We get kind of a darkish mammoth. Probably means kind of darkish eyes, too. Here, why don't we do... Hmm. I was going to say do blue eyes, but that's probably not right for how dark our mammoth ended up being. Um... Maybe we'll do... I don't want to do brown, because I already used a bunch of brown. I want to use the eyes as an excuse to put a little splash of color in. Uh, maybe we'll dodge our yellow too. Maybe we'll do like a we got like a nice dark green in here somewhere. Yeah, let's do that. I think we'll take where's that red brush? So I think I'll put a little red in the ears too. Here's our another spot where you tend to get a lot of extra blood flow relative to other parts of the body. So a little bit of redness in the ears, I think, will 
add a little something something here. Let's put a little dab on them. And then I'm just going to get a whole new brush out. So I got my own dish of brushes over here. I can use how many I want. And kind of blend that. I'm saying blend and not smear because it sounds better. Sounds like I know what I'm doing and talking about if I say I'm blending it rather than smearing it. I'm running a little long on my painty part of this, but we'll talk a little bit about the other stuff in a second here, because I'm just winding up and our, our mammoth painting is about to start, so i got to get this guy over to the table. He's got an important job to do of being an example of why it's okay to not be good at this. <laughs> so, here's my mammoth. He said he ended up a little darker than I wanted him to be because I dropped him in my dark brown paint. But, you know, a little bit extra red in the tusks because I mixed my brushes on accident. Green eyes, I, you know, wanted it to be a little bit more reddish in the trunk and ears because, like I said, you typically are going to get some extra blood flow in there. But, you know, we got a little extra, a little extra smeared around in there that I didn't necessarily intend on doing. The trunk's even a little little redder than I necessarily wanted, but I don't think I'm going to do anything about that necessarily. Nope, nope, not that one. That's the tricky part about doing these in all one sitting is your paint tends to not be dry when you're working with it. You know, ideally, if you're really spending a lot of time painting, you probably want to do some painting, let the coat dry, do some more painting, let your coat dry, you know, do that type of thing, but I don't really have time for that when I'm doing these. There we go. A beautiful addition to my collection of very expertly painted critters. Hey, Finn. <laughs> okay. Just gonna set this aside because Carl and friends are setting up over there for painting. So I'm gonna set that aside, and that's gonna go over there. It's got its got its duty to fulfill over there. I put my paints away here. Get all my brushes in the uh, in the water. And then, part two of our show, we're going to talk a little bit about garbage and waste disposal and composting and all that good stuff. It's sort of uh, what part two is going to be. And so like I said, this is going to be sort of the normal Friday show. It's, we're doing a little bit late here, about 15, about 15 minutes late on this portion of the show. But like I said, we've had content leading up to now. And so, you probably saw, I guess I don't even know who read, I didn't actually watch the, watch back the video of the reading itself, because I wasn't here, so you might have noticed that it wasn't Lee doing the reading this week, it was Philip and Spencer, who you've seen off and on on camera over the last, like, few weeks, they're uh, BSU students who have been doing sort of an internship here, and have been helping me and Lee out with our shows on Wednesday and Friday. Because me and Lee were at the Boys and Girls Club doing stuff, they stepped in and did the reading. So I don't know who read. Maybe both of them read a little bit. But they were reading some books about... Covered in paint. Only a little bit. It's dry. About composting and sort of garbage disposal stuff. And so the main one they were reading was called All That Trash. And it was talking about this, like, uh, this garbage barge that, like... Somehow or another, I you know, didn't read the book either, to be honest. I just kind of vaguely know what it was about. But it was a barge full of 
you know, human garbage that, you know, was kind of trying to find a spot to, like, be delivered. And so it was just kind of floating around out in the ocean for, I want to say it was like months where it was happening, where, you know, they couldn't get anybody to take this. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about, like, how we dispose of garbage, you know, the types of garbage that, you know, exist that we produce, you know, kind of waste as an idea, what we can do about it, what's what are good ways to limit how much waste we produce. And so, still just like tidying up a little bit here. Gotta get all my stuff out of the way. Gotta do a, a scene, a scene change here. All right. So, the kind of reason that we were doing this as like a subject was because one of the things that is. Uh, what we do here every year is we do this event called E-Cubed. And it, every year E-Cubed has like a theme to it. And so this year the theme is sort of about sustainability and as one of the sort of promotional things that we're doing for E-Cubed is we are, uh, we have this big uh, like compost. It's like a big terrarium that has a bunch of compost in it. It's in our front window. So anytime you're walking, you know, down Beltrami Avenue, you can walk past the front of the Science Center and see we have this big, big tank in our front window that's got a bunch of compost in it. And so we've been talking a lot about compost and composting here at the Headwater Science Center for the last few months as we've been like s sorting out the best way to like make good compost and like get the compost that we have out there to like, you know, do its thing to, you know, decay and become, you know, valuable soil. And so I have here this is kind of courtesy of Chuck. We're doing some stuff with Earth Day tomorrow and so Chuck has a had a pot set up that has a bunch of our compost from here at the Headwater Science Center, excuse me, in it. And you know, I can get a kind of a look at it. We've had this compost bin going for, you know, maybe a couple months at this point. And you can see what we're working with in there and we can even take a look at it. And some of it's still kind of identifiable as what it is. It looks like some, uh, you know, like this is just like some straw that's in there. You know, we use that for all sorts of things. It's bedding for like the turtles. Uh, um, probably be what that's from, I would assume. Uh, might be hay that's just like browned up a little bit. Might be Timothy hay, in which case we give that to like the guinea pigs and the rabbits and things like that. So it might be waste hay that, you know, didn't get used. Um, you can see definitely looks like some fruit peels in there, which we get a lot of. That is, uh, you know, fruits and veggies or something that we get donated to us from, uh, um, Harmony Co-op in downtown Bemidji donates us like all their fruits and vegetables once they expire and aren't sellable to people anymore They send them here and that's where a lot of our animal food comes from is from Harmony And so as a result of that a lot of the stuff ends up You know in our compost especially things like peels and things like that <coughs> So yeah, I'm, I'm done with all the painting stuff you can take as much of it as you want <coughs> Um, we have a little bit in there that is poop. Um, so we've been collecting off and on the, the poop from specifically the bunnies and the guinea pigs, and we mix that in there a little bit, so you can see a little bit of that in there. That, that breaks down pretty quick, so you don't really see it much in there. Um, I know Lee at some point was putting, uh, like balsam branches, needles, whatever in it as well. Um, I can see in there maybe maybe some coffee grounds potentially I know there was some hair that we put in there and so kind of this interesting thing with compost is you want it to be made up of a bunch of different stuff but you want to be kind of specific about what you're using too and so for example if you were to just dump a whole pile of oranges out in a tank out there it's not going to do very well as compost because it's going to be one way too acidic for the uh, the bacteria to really thrive in, um, so it's not going to break down very quickly. Um, would be the main thing that would prevent it from being very good compost. Um, and so you generally want to have a mix of different things that is going to facilitate bacteria growing really effectively 
in that pile of stuff. Um, but then also break down into things that, you know, typically if you're composting, you want to use it for something. And more often than not, that is uh, like growing stuff in, like you use it as like a supplement for your soil typically. And so uh, kind of the interesting thing with compost is, like I said, the, the composition, the composition of the compost uh, not only affects like how quickly it's going to compost, how quickly it's going to decay, but also, like I said, how useful it necessarily is going to be for the uh, the things you're trying to grow in it later. Um, and so you got to be mindful of a few things with that. Um, and basically what you're doing, like I said, when you're composting is you're generally trying to create an environment that is really beneficial for bacteria to grow in. And so what you end up doing is you uh, need a bunch of carbon and nitrogen, basically. The carbon is basically what you're breaking down um, all the organic material that you're putting in there is like primarily made of carbon. Um, so that poop we're talking about, it's mostly carbon, those leaves, those fruit peels, all that thing like that is mostly made up of carbon is the gist of what it's made out of. Um, you want to be aerating it because those bacteria, most of them are what we would call aerobic bacteria, which means that they rely on oxygen is to like do their body processes. So like humans also would be considered an aerobic thing. We rely on oxygen. And so doing things like turning your compost, this is why you'll see a lot of like specifically like composting like bins and things like that will be like have a crank on them so you can like turn them around. That's what aerating is, is you're, you know, exposing different parts of them to outside air for the sake of, like I said, letting the stuff that's inside get oxygen. Uh, managing temperature is pretty important. So what's kind of cool is that, um, you know, we kind of are talking about stuff as a waste product here, things like, you know, garbage as a waste product that humans make. But humans make other waste products too, like bodies just produce waste. That's what, you know, uh, poop is, is, you know, waste that your body produces as a byproduct of doing other things. Um, and the bacteria that are in this are also producing waste. And so that waste can be is it stuff that they're sort of supplementing into the compost itself. So like a lot of the, I want to say a lot of the nitrogen that is in compost is like a product of the bacteria producing waste basically, but also as a product of all their body processes that they're doing, um, they're also producing heat as a waste product. Um, and that heat again, like ends up helping out with the decomposition process makes the, uh, the compost, uh, work basically. So like compost typically is going to be warmer than the air around it because it's full of bacteria that are doing all their processes and producing heat as a waste product in and of themselves. And so compost, I guess, it typically is going to be warmer than the air around it. And so managing and maintaining the temperature in such a way that is like healthy for the bacteria to be in is also very important when it comes to composting. Um, another thing that is important to manage is pH. It's like I talked about how you wouldn't want to just like dump a bunch of oranges or lemons or whatever out there because it's going to be too acidic. Um, acid is pretty hostile towards uh, bacteria growth. It really stymies bacteria growth. It's a great experiment that you can do actually. I, I, judge, the, I judge the science fair here in town most years and uh, there's a group of girls that did a great experiment this year where they took a bunch of different types of fruit and uh, measured their pHs and then did like an observation where they set them out and observed how much they decomposed, how much they decayed over like a certain amount of time. I don't remember exactly what it was. And their hypothesis was that the, the orange, the citrus thing that they had was going to decom decompose the most quickly because it's acidic. But really, it works the exact opposite way, where acids are very hostile towards the things that actually do decomposition. And so the orange was the slowest thing that they had, and it was, you know, the banana or whatever it was that they were also had that was the, the fastest decomposing one. So great experiment, very illustrative of, like I said, a common problem that people who do composting might run into, where if you're, um, you know, dumping too much of the same stuff in your compost, you might have pH issues. And so... You know, if you're dumping a bunch of like eggshells, for example, if you're somebody who like, you know, is eating a three egg omelet every morning and dumping all those eggshells into your compost, you might have the opposite problem where you have a compost bin that is really alkaline, really basic, um, has a, a high pH, um, which is also not going to be ideal for experiencing like the bacterial growth that you're looking to get in there either. So ideally, like 
testing your pH of your compost is a great thing to be doing. And generally what you want is a pH that is like right around neutral-ish, like floating at about seven, like give or take, like a 6.5 to 7.5 is about like the ideal that you want to be for composting. Um, maybe slightly acidic, maybe a cl little bit closer to that 6.5 is like the real like optimal optimal that you're trying to get. Um, but as long as you're floating right around a 7, that's gonna be fine for you as far as like producing compost. Um, and 7 would be the pH of water. Like uh, pure water is a, is a 7. Um, and I guess the pH is a term I'm using a lot and, you know, using terms like acids and bases and alkaline and things like that. And those are maybe terms that you guys don't know. So pH is actually an acronym. It talks, it's for potential hydrogen, I think is what it is. The H is definitely hydrogen. I don't know if the P is potential or it's like power of hydrogen, maybe something like that. Um, and so basically what pH is measuring is the amount of free sort of positively charged hydrogen ions that there are floating around in a given thing and so uh, an ion is an element that has a charge on it somehow or another whether that be a positive or a negative charge and so something that is very acidic has a lot of positively charged hydrogen in it um, that's kind of floating around freely like ready to bond with stuff um, something that is very alkaline doesn't it has negatively charged uh, I don't remember exactly what it is to be honest, but has a negative charge to it, which bonds with different stuff. And so basically when you're talking about pH, you're talking about its tendency to bond with certain things versus other things is the long and short of it. Okay, so we can talk a little bit more about sort of trash and waste and different types. Um, and so, one of the things that's sort of interesting to think about is like what we have here at the Science Center, like if you come here and do a field trip, we'll end up with like a bunch of different bins up there, like when kids are eating lunch that we'll have for people to like dump their things into after lunch. So we'll have like our standard trash can, which is like what we would say, like if you want to get into like the industry term for it, you have your solid waste. And so that is, like I said, when you think of like a trash can, basically what you're thinking of is like solid waste. Um, there is uh, recyclables, so this is, you know, glass and plastic and uh, paper and things like that. Things that can be reprocessed and reused into something else, so that would be recyclable things. Uh, we have compost, which would, this would be like heavily carbon-based sort of organic stuff that, like I said, we can throw outside and it's going to decompose and actually be beneficial for, like, the soil and the life around it, that decomposition process. Um, those are the three bins that like you'll see like us have around here at the Science Center in a pretty typical setting. Um, we do actually on occasion, well we have another type of waste that the Science Center produces which would be uh, like sewage basically and so like we have plumbing, we have bathrooms and so we eject waste out the building that way and it's just a different type of waste that goes through a whole different process that what like solid waste and recycling and stuff would go through. Um, that goes into like water treatment plants and things like that, which is a whole different way than what we you know don't even necessarily think about is you know waste product, but it's a very important part of like producing or not producing of dealing with waste is having to deal with things like sewage. Um, the other sort of rarer one, one that you know you probably won't see around your house, but you know as you know if you're somebody who works in a place that you know like this or really honestly just kind of works anywhere you might see is uh, hazardous waste stuff. And so there are certain things that you can't just like throw in the garbage. And so like the most common thing that we would encounter here that would you know qualify as hazardous waste would be uh, like biohazardous type of stuff, stuff that could potentially be, uh, could cause a person to get sick basically if they were to encounter it directly. So like a real easy like common thing that you might see that would count as like a biohazard material would be that if somebody like was like bleeding so if somebody gets like a bloody nose and we stuff you know rags up their nose you're not supposed to just like throw those bloody rags into the normal garbage you're supposed to throw them in a biohazard bin or if we get a kid who you know pukes all over the floor 
you know, that vomit technically is a biohazard material that, you know, we should be disposing of in, you know, these red biohazard bags and it goes to a different place when we're actually uh, disposing of the waste. Um, human waste would count as that too. Um, basically any sort of like body fluid type of thing would count as a biohazard is the, the main thing that we, like we would encounter here. Um, otherwise there is, you know, certain other things that have sort of special disposal methods too. So, uh, you know, like certain cleaning materials, for example, you shouldn't just like throw in your garbage. So, you know, you shouldn't just like pour bleach down your sink or things like that. If we wanted to dispose of that, you know, that's got a very special process, a different set of bags that goes into a different hazardous waste disposal process. Uh, electronics end up being very similar to this. Like you're not supposed to just like dump a TV in the garbage because it has components in it that can be uh, hazardous to like soils if they just go into a like landfill and you know one they're not going to break down very quickly in the landfill but as they do break down they're probably going to leach stuff into the soil that you don't want to into your soil and so different process for all that type of stuff and anytime you are going to like a dump or a landfill to like leave waste there they're going to want to separate that stuff out and do a separate process basically um but going back to compost, like I said, a lot of times when you're composting, generally the idea is you're trying to produce something that is going to be beneficial for like plants to grow in is sort of the gist of it. But I want to talk a little bit about sort of what makes something good for plants to grow in. Like what are the nutritional elements of like good soil for plants? And so, you know, your oxygen content is part of it. That's why I hear about people like aerating their soil. Um, nitrogen is a huge part of it. That's, like I said, is why... A lot of times what you're trying to get out of compost is a bunch of nitrogen, basically. Uh, a lot of plants also really like phosphorus. And so what you're really, uh, you, you do get plants that can exist in places that are really deficient in these things though, but typically you have to be like very specially adapted for it. And so what I have here in front of me is a pitcher plant. Um, and so if you come and visit us here at the Science Center, we have an exhibit down on the main exhibit floor, kind of over by Critter Corner, that has a bunch of bog plants in it. And there's another tank over there that also has a bunch of uh, what are called carnivorous plants in it. And I've always thought that the I, the name carnivorous plants is kind of a misnomer, because when you're talking about carnivory, usually you're talking about eating. And when you're talking about eating, usually you're talking about consuming a thing for calories. You're getting energy out of it, is what a, a calorie is. Um, but what's kind of interesting about the quote unquote carnivorous plants is they do sort of consume things. They do, uh, you know, things like insects and small vertebrates, whatever, whatever. They do consume those things. They do put them into their body and use them, but they're not really getting calories out of them. They're not getting like energy out of them. What they're getting from them is like nutritional supplements. You know, a, a pitcher plant eating a fly isn't getting calories out of it. It's not getting energy out of it. It's getting, you know, it's taking it as a multivitamin. It's getting nitrogen and phosphorus out of it. And so, like I said, it's kind of this really unique adaptation that stuff that exists in really nutrient deficient soils has to deal with is come up with ways to, you know, get around it, basically, if it wants to keep existing. And so what's really cool about pitcher plants, and this is true for a lot of the carnivorous plants, is they adapt their leaves into some sort of trap as far as, you know, catching a, a animal. Um, but there's a trade-off to that. So like this leaf here is really not very good as far as like gathering sunlight. Like this pitcher plant is not as good at collecting sunlight as like, you know, a normal shaped sort of roundish, you know, big broad wide leaf is. And so there's sort of a trade-off that has to happen where you can live in these areas that have these really deficient soils by making these goofy adaptations for your leaves. But the trade-off you're making is that you can only really do it in places where you're getting like a ton, a ton, a ton of sunlight. And so you'll see it happen in areas where there really isn't any like overstory ahead of you. There's no canopy of trees above you to like be blocking sunlight. Um, I said, kind of a weird trade off where you have to, you're, you're trading your ability to get collect sunlight for this ability to pull nitrogen from a different source than what other plants have to pull their nitrogen from. Um, and what's interesting here is like we've had this this bog tank with these carnivorous plants in it here for three and a half years now almost. We got it in, I want to say it was like October-ish 2018 is when we put that tank in. Um, and we haven't had to feed them the entire time. Like uh, we had, when we initially put it in, we're planning on like uh, we were going to culture like Daphnia 
So these little microscopic invertebrates to be feeding to them. Our Daphnia tank crashed, and we were just like, well, we'll see how it works, I guess. And we haven't had to feed any of them because the soil that they're in is much more nutritious than the basically the soil that they are growing in naturally. So they're getting the nutrients they need from the soil while, you know, still being carnivorous plants, basically, even though they never eat. So that's kind of a interesting little twist on it there. Um, let's see. We'll check. Do one last quick browse of our uh, my outline here that my, my interns made for me. But we've been talking for almost uh, almost an hour at this point, so. Okay, like I said, kind of a weird little double feature of a show today. We're talking about mammoths and scientists. Triple feature almost. A little brief talk about mammoths. A little brief talk about, you know, what is science? What is a scientist? A little brief talk about uh, waste disposal and decomposition and uh, uh, composting. So... Kind of all over the place, but I had fun talking about it. I always like doing these kind of weird eclectic shows. They're my favorite ones, to be honest. Uh, the Headwater Science Center is open seven days a week, so if you come and visit us on Monday through Saturday, we are open from 9.30 to 5. If you come on Sunday, we are open from 1 to 5. Um, if you happen to come by at 3.30, we may or may not be doing one of these shows. We do them some days, we do them not some days. Um, we're going to be pretty dramatically like dialing back the number of shows we're doing relatively soon here just because May is our busiest month as far as like field trip groups and stuff like that go. And so we're just not going to have as much time to be doing it. So you probably won't see us around as much if at all for the next like couple months, but we'll probably pick them up more and more often in the fall again once uh, we slow down a little bit. Um, like I said, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you again whenever we happen to see you again.